Good morning. We're so glad you're here. My name is Nikki Green. This is Connor Wood. Good morning, and everyone. We so glad to be with you all. We're happy to welcome you to Eastview Christian Church this morning. Yes, uh, we're in uh, the main space at our normal campus. People it's are coming buzzing, in. It's buzzing. It's exciting. If you're anywhere around Bloomington Normal, we hope that you will join us at 9 or 11 today. Yes, and if this is your first Sunday joining us online, or maybe you join us regularly, we would love to hear from you. Uh, below, there's going to be a number that pops up. It's a simple way to text hello. We have real people on the other side of that number ready to answer any questions you may have about Eastview or even pray with you. Uh, so take us up on that offer, text hello, and we'd love to get to know who you are today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, today we're continuing in this sermon series called Hope. It's leading up through Easter, and we have all kinds of fun things that go along with it. We have bookmarks and stickers, and the bookmarks have all the themes of the day. And today's theme is on forgiveness. And um, we have a special guest speaker. I don't know Tommy Politz um, from Hillside in Texas, but I know he's a dear friend of our senior pastor, Mike Baker, and Mike loves him and is a trusted friend. And so I know we're in for a special treat today. Yeah, Mike was talking about he had, that Tommy has a special testimony that's gonna speak to this topic. And so yeah. if you're someone who really connects to stories and loves to hear um, how people overcome hard things through Jesus, I think Tommy's story is really gonna resonate uh, with yeah. you today. Yeah, absolutely. We just think this sermon series is a great opportunity to invite friends to church. So today, if you know someone that is in need of forgiveness or needs to forgive someone, this is a great time to invite them to watch Eastview online with you, or maybe jump in and come to the 11 o'clock service, um, or even share the sermon later in the week with them. It's gonna be a great service. On that note, Nate, can I borrow that book yeah, for a second? Yeah, absolutely. If you come to one of our campuses, even one of our microsites, we have these bookmarks and stickers, and on the back, all the specific topics are there, and you may say, man, I have a friend that really needs to hear the message, God cares. That's kind of the heart behind me, so you yeah. can kind of tailor you know, this Sunday to your friend or family member that needs to hear a certain message. So that, that was kind of what, what, yeah, why absolutely. we wanted to make these. So yeah. take us up on that. And I just mentioned the word microsite. If you're wondering what that is, basically it's a small gathering of people that live outside of Bloomington Normal that call Eastview home. We have gatherings in Washington, Illinois right now and um, Hersher, Illinois. So shout out to them. We know you guys are tuning Love in you guys. today. Hope you're having a great, <laughs> a great Sunday so far. But maybe you join Eastview outside of the state of Illinois, outside of Bloomington Normal and you want to gather with people, you're missing in-person community, we would love to talk to you more about what it could look like to start something like that. Yeah. You can text hello to the same number below like we talked about in the beginning, and we'd love to answer any questions about that and mm -hmm. tell you how you can begin starting that where you're at. Yeah, because those just started really with a group of people in those areas that said, hey, we know some other people that live around us that watch Eastview, and we want to do it. So we're like, great, we want to help you. So if that's you, we can't wait to hear from you. Well, if you are trying to find your people and your places around Eastview, we have a very special event coming up. And I was talking about this earlier. I've been in Southern California this last week visiting churches. I'm just reminded how much I love my church family and how important it is to be with your people and know your places. And so if that's you and you are trying to figure out where your place is at Eastview, this event coming up in two weeks, starting point is just for you. You need to register at eastview.church slash starting point. We're joining online and hybrid um, in person. So it'll be a great time and we hope that you'll join us um, on March 5th at 1030. The service starting right after this, we hope you all enjoy.
Hey, good morning, Eastview. As you guys are coming in here, make your way, find yourself a seat. We're so thankful that you're here worshiping with us. Wanted to start the service off with uh, a word from the Lord, uh, from Psalm 145. That says, in verse 17, it says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. And then verse 21 says, My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. I just want to encourage you as you stand with us right now, and we're, we're about to begin to worship. Um, just to the east of us, if you have not heard, uh, there is uh, 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 the word revival is going around in, in Kentucky, and we're so thankful. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And I'm, I'm seeing people that are, are doing that, praising God for that, and I'm also seeing some uh, skepticism in this. And I just want to encourage you that uh, we don't want to be the type of people that put out a fire because we didn't start it, right? And so we just want to let the, the fan the flame and let God do what he wants to do in our own lives and here at this place. So I just ask you and, and implore you, let's worship God because he's worthy now and here. Amen? Let's do that. I count on one thing The same God who never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Oh, yes, I will. same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. And I choose to praise, to glorify. Glorify the name of all names Then nothing can stand against And I choose to praise To glorify, glorify the name of all names Then nothing can stand against And I choose to praise To glorify, glorify the name of all names Put your hands together. 
saw Satan fall like lightning. Woo. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. And I have a resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters. Bought with blood and washing water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony. If I'm not dead, you're not dead. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not dead. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not dead. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not dead. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. This is my testimony from death to life. Come on. Because grace rewrote my story. I'm justified. By Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Testimony from death to life, cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come on, praise him, church. He is worthy. spoke for me mercy spoke for me oh mercy spoke for me it was on Golgotha's tree his death brought liberty his death brought liberty oh his death brought liberty may I never boast in anything 
except the cross of Jesus Christ. May I not forget the blood he shed. It is by his death I am alive. Because of Christ, I am alive. What a humble sacrifice, love that wash me clean, love that wash me clean. Oh, love that washed me clean. What a blessed mystery. His punishment, my peace. His punishment, my peace. Oh, his punishment, my peace. May I never boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. May I not forget the blood he shed. It is by his death I am alive. May I never boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ May I not forget the blood he shed It is by his death I am alive Because of Christ I am alive All right church you know this part Come on Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, death has lost its grip on me, yes, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus rose in victory, he's alive, alive in me. Jesus Christ May I not forget The blood he shed It is by his death I am alive Because of Christ I am alive Because of Christ I am alive because of Christ, 
Amen. Jesus, because of you, we have life. Because of you, Jesus, we have hope. And because of you, Jesus, we have forgiveness. God, let it be so. In your name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Guys, it's good to be with you today. We're going to continue in our hope series. And in just a few uh, moments, we're going to have a guest preacher, Tommy Pulitz, coming. He's going to be preaching about something that I think is going to be really helpful and really challenging. The idea is forgiveness. And I, in my life, there's two sides of forgiveness. I'm really good on one side, not good on the other. I'll let you decide for yourself what you're good at. But by the end of our time today, I know that if you're paying attention, the Holy Spirit's got something to move and to shift and to, sh and to change in our hearts. We can't wait to see what God does in the midst of that as we move forward, I just wanna highlight a couple of different values that we have here at Eastview. One of those is that we just wanna make sure that everybody is known. And so if you're visiting us today online or here in person, we just want you to know that this is a really cool place. We'd love to get to know you. If this is a regular place for you, we want you to know that there's nothing that you need to go through on your own, that we're here for you. And so there's two ways in which you could respond to that. You can go to the family room if you're here in person. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to help you take your next steps. Or for all of us, you could text hello to the number on the screen at any time, and our staff would love to interact with you and make sure that you're seen today. Another value that we have is that we desire for every student to encounter Jesus. And if you're paying attention at all, right, this generation is hungry and they need peace. They want to know who Jesus is. And in, in fashion of that, we took an offering not too long ago at Christmas time, and we said a lot of that money is gonna go towards funding camps so that every student that wants to go could go. And those camps are open right now. We are excited to say that those are at reduced cost and we have a ton of scholarships that are available, more than we've ever had before. And so here's the take home for you. If your student wants to go, make sure they get there, but also ask them, who do you want to go with you? Because we want every student to encounter Jesus this summer. One more thing that we value around here is that we are people that are invitational, meaning that we invite people into the things that we know to be true. I'm talking about um, the E! News, uh, believe it or not, because there's a lot of things that are in there every week that are invitational in nature. So you could read that and be like, okay, what's in it for me? Or you could read it in a way that's like, how can I invite somebody to this next thing? Three quick things I wanna highlight that are very invitational in nature. The Women's If Gathering in March that's coming up. Adult volleyball leagues are coming, and also we're gonna have our first ever young adult conference in April. All of those uh, give you the opportunity to, uh, to practice that value of invitation. One more thing, I'd like to pray for us, and uh, we're gonna continue in our worship in just a moment, but feel free to stand if you'd like. I received this this week, been going through a really difficult time uh, with some family stuff, but this blessed me. I offer it to you today. This is a prayer, Jesus, we come to you with burdens. We come to you with doubts. Would you please calm and quiet us with peace? Would you empty us of anxiety and concerns? Would you loosen our grip on disappointments and will you loosen the grievances that we hold too tightly to? Release us from hurts, release us from anger, release us from fears, renew our hearts, renew us spiritually, Give us strength. Give us forgiveness. Let us live freely. In Jesus' name, amen. was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind and I was running out of time and sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your sight so you made a way 
across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt i owed broke my chains freed my soul for the first time i had hope and thank you jesus for the blood applied and thank you jesus it has washed me white and thank you jesus you have saved my life you've brought me from the darkness into glorious light yes you have and you took my place laid inside my tomb of sin and you were buried for three days but then you walked right out again yes and now death has no sting and life has no end for i have been transformed by the blood of the the blood applied and thank you Jesus it has washed me white and thank you Jesus you have saved my life you brought me from the darkness into glorious light darkness into glorious light and glory to his name we sing glory oh glory to his name can go ahead and have a seat, but I don't want to be so quick to transition out of that moment. I want us to just sit for a moment thinking about the glory of God and what he's done in each of our lives and, and meditate on that. So just take a moment 
we worship you, Lord. We thank you for this moment. We know your spirit is in this place. We ask that you would continue to speak to us. Our hearts are open. Well, I have the privilege of introducing our guest preacher today, but he's not really a guest. He's a friend of Eastview, Tommy Pollitz. Tommy has been a friend of Eastview for quite some time. Tommy met the best friend of his life, Donna, at Baylor University. They've been married for 30 years. Sick and bears, a few people here. Uh, he's got three adult kids, two of which went to Baylor, followed in his footsteps. One was treasonous and did not. That's my words, not Tommy's. He's got three adult kids. Tommy's the senior pastor at Hillside Christian Church in Amarillo, Texas. And last year, myself and Mike, our lead pastor, a few other of our staff had the opportunity to travel to Amarillo and meet with Tommy and learn from him and his team. And God's doing a really cool thing at Hillside Christian Church. We're blessed to know them. And so we're grateful for that. Mike's a great friend of Tommy's and Mike respects his leadership ability, but most of all his preaching and his teaching gift. And we believe that months ago when we planned to have Tommy here, it's for this exact moment. So we believe you're here not by accident, but to hear what God has laid on Tommy's heart. So would you welcome Tommy up to the preaching platform with a warm Eastview Christian Church welcome. Thank you, man. Well, thank you, Eastview. It's so great to be with you today and uh, grateful to have an opportunity to open up the Word of God and to share with you. Tyler, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, Mike and Sarah have been great friends for many years uh, as we meet at roundtables or conferences and having an opportunity to discuss different things. Uh, our churches carry a lot of similarities. Uh, Hillside is a multi-site church with 11 locations in Texas and one in New Mexico. And uh, I'm grateful for an opportunity anytime I get to come to a like-minded church to share the Word of God and open it up. And so I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, welcome to everybody uh, watching online or at one of the other uh, campuses. I just want to say to, to you, I pray God's blessings on you. Also, I want to say a word to uh, Mike and Sarah. Last night while I was uh, uh, in the hotel room, uh, Mike and I talked on the phone. And Mike, I know you say you watch this service at 9 o'clock every week, and I just want you to know that oh, I love you, and I'm grateful for you, and I know this church family loves you as you're spending time with family. Hey, uh, Eastview, let's give it up and show Mike some love and appreciation. <laughs> Several months ago, when Mike was asking me about coming and uh, told, told me you'd be in this series on hope. And I think about hope all throughout the Bible. Hope is given to us from Genesis to Revelation, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. And there is a tremendous message of hope. In the book of Isaiah, hope is surrounded and encapsulated in the spirit of salvation and forgiveness. Because in this world and life, if you do not have forgiveness, you have no hope. If there's no forgiveness, what happens to our sins? If there's no forgiveness, what happens to our lives? If there's no forgiveness, what happens to our ontology, like who we are in being and in process? Hope comes because the God of all hope gives us a wonderful commission of forgiveness, and it's not just in the book of Isaiah with the prophet prophesying and saying, this is something I want. It begins with Genesis, goes all the way through to Revelation, and it is central throughout the scriptures. Jesus was so serious about this that in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, he said these words. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not, your Father will not forgive your sins. These are the words of Christ. Now, if we misunderstand this, we can think that we earn forgiveness. That is, that forgiveness from God is attached to forgiving others. So what I do is I forgive others, and therefore that puts me in good standing with God and somehow makes God, what, in debt to me to forgive me. That is a total misunderstanding of the Scripture. This Scripture implies something deeply that Jesus teaches in another story. 
But forgiveness is so serious to the Lord that he gives us this beautiful warning right after teaching us, teaching the disciples how it is that we are to pray. But if we miss what Jesus has to say in the Bible, we may miss one of the most powerful things God will ever give us, and that is the gift of forgiving someone else. Truly the gift of forgiving someone else. What it does in our heart and what it does in our life. When our kids were little, Don and I have been married 30 years, Grant, Rebecca, and Cole, they're now, let's see, 26, 24, and 21. We had three weddings in 17 months. No, 19 months, sorry. Three weddings and a first grandbaby in 19 months. Can I get a, a, a bless your heart? <laughs> All right. Now, y'all know I'm from Texas, so we do barbecue really well, brisket barbecue, the Dallas Cowboys, and we know how to bless somebody's heart. No booing for the Cowboys. Come on, I'm a guest speaker. Be a little nicer than that. Bow your head, let me pray for you. Get behind me, Satan. Anyway, so, so, so here's the deal. Listen, so, so we, you know, we do these things, but we also have sayings uh, like people say, bless your heart. And of course, in Texas, don't ever think somebody's doing your favor when they bless your heart. Oh, bless your heart. That's just code word language for you're so stupid. That's really <laughs> what it means. And, and, and so when, when, when I think about those three weddings, and I think about my kids, and I think about their life and all the changes, I'm reminded that when they were really little and we had planted a church in the North Atlanta area, I've been serving at Hillside now for 18 years. I'm, I'm in my 18th year there as a senior pastor, but we planted a church in the North Atlanta area in Alpharetta, what's now Milton, Georgia. And when we started this church, uh, the kids were very, very little. Our youngest wasn't even born, but... Uh, our 26-year-old son, Grant, he was five, no, four, about four years old. Rebecca, my daughter, is probably about two and a half years old. So they're about four and two and a half years old. We go to Chuck E. Cheese, and uh, we play the games, eat the pizza, do all the things. And then afterwards, they've got the helium balloons. We get into the minivan, and you know how it is. We, it started with like three, mini, uh, three balloons, but you know how it is. One of them ended up in the sky, bye-bye, before we even got into the van. The other one gets popped while we're in the van. One balloon makes it home that's got to be shared between two kids. I'm just saying, you know what happens when that happens. It's on. It's, it's, it's a fight, probably like some of you had on the ride to church this morning in your cars, right? And, and so, so what happened was uh, the last balloon ends up in our living room, two-story house, right? And it goes all the way up to the top ceiling, and the kids are like, Daddy, get the balloon, get the balloon. I'm like, I can't get the balloon, kids. It's way too high. Daddy, you got to get the balloon. Grant goes, go get the ladder in the garage. I was like, it's not going to help. Yeah, will, Dad. So I go in the uh, garage. I grab the ladder. I set up this ladder, I don't know, it's a six or eight foot ladder, and uh, I start walking up the ladder. I know there's no way I'm gonna be able to get to the ribbon on that helium balloon. Well, I get to that step that's the, t you know, the, the top step there, and, and I'm reaching up and I'm showing him, and I'm nowhere near that ribbon. And I hear my two little kids, four, four Grant's four, Rebecca's two and a half, say, Daddy, go to the top step. And I'm like, I'm on the top step. No, 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 daddy, the next step. You know that step that has that label that says, this is not a step, you idiot. <laughs> so, so Forrest Gump here gets up on the top, top step on that ladder. And as I'm standing there and I'm doing, I'm on my tippy, he goes, daddy, reach further. I said, kids, I'm showing you, I still can't get it. I hear, jump for it, dad, jump for it. <laughs> I am not jumping for it. <laughs> so I come down and they go, okay, daddy, that's all right. Mommy will get it when she gets home. <laughs> I said, your mother will not get this when she gets home. She had done the one thing. She's like, hey, honey, can you watch the kids? I just want to go uh, get, you know, go grocery shopping. And so I uh, say, okay, your mother can't get that. I'm taller than her. My reach is longer than hers. There's no way she's going to be able to get it. That's okay, Daddy, she'll get it. And they run upstairs and go play. Your mother's not gonna get that. Well, Donna comes home. They hear the garage door go up. I hear the two little rugrats running down the stairs, you know, coming down quickly. Mommy, 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 mommy. And she looks and she's carrying the groceries. She looks and sees the ladder. And she says, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, the balloon and the kids. And they said, and, and they think that you could get, mommy, daddy couldn't get it, but we told him you'd get it. And she goes, all right, all right, let me just put the groceries down. I'll get it. I said, you will not. <laughs> 
get that balloon. It's, it's, this is the tallest ladder we have in the house. I'm taller than you. My reach is longer than yours. She says, let me just finish putting down the groceries. She puts down the groceries. She goes in the laundry room, grabs a broomstick, goes to the junk drawer, gets scotch tape, put it on the end, walks up the ladder, touches it to the ribbon, pulls it down, walks down the ladder and hands it to the kids. <laughs> That's not funny. Man, my congregation's laughing at me right now. And then, of course, she looked at me with that look. Bless your heart. <laughs> Pride will keep you from seeing the obvious. Pride will have you miss the simple. The enemy will gut you by causing you to live with resentment and bitterness and poison, thinking that you maintain power as you hate, build resentment and grudges against a father who walked out on you, against a mom who abandoned you, against an ex-spouse who burns you in love, against a brother that you haven't spoken to because something was said at the Thanksgiving table 14 years ago and you haven't spoken since. Something happened between you and your sister 15 years ago, 15 months ago, and you haven't spoken since. Somebody stole an idea of yours at work, took credit for it, and is getting and reaping the blessings and the benefit. They even received a promotion for it. And you boil inside a roommate that betrayed you, a business partner that embezzled money from you and cost you dearly. There is so much pain in this world because we can harbor resentment and bitterness and grief. And I know it, I get it. You're like, hey, what would you know? You're a guest speaker here. You don't know the first thing about me. I don't have to. I know the promises of God's holy word. I know that in the Corinthian correspondence, God's word, the apostle Paul tells us that there is no temptation that is common, that is not common to each man or person, right? That there is no temptation that you face or that I face. And the temptation from the enemy is for us to continue to be angry and bitter and seek vengeance. And, and this does not work because really what we are doing is allowing the circumstances and the situation and the enemy, the evil one, to have power over us. This is why Jesus knows how important it is when the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 3 13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, you got any grievances here today? Anybody got a grievance here today? Raise your hand if you got a grievance today, right? Okay, two or three of you. Good, 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 good. <laughs> If you have a grievance against someone, what would Jesus say in the Gospels? He said, don't even bring your offering to the altar. First, go and be reconciled with them. Then bring your offering. What's the implication? The greatest offering we could bring to the Lord today is an offering of what? A living aroma, a pleasing sacrifice of the body. Romans chapter 12. What shall be our pleasing sacrifice to the Lord? A heart that forgives those that he cares for, a heart that moves and is molded and shaped by what Jesus taught and what Jesus did. But notice this, bear with each other, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive how? As the Lord forgave you. To forgive as the Lord forgave, we must pay attention to what Jesus taught and what Jesus did. We have to. All right, I wanna forgive as you, Lord, have forgiven. So now what do I do? I pay attention to what Jesus taught and I pay attention to what Jesus did. First of all, what did Jesus teach? Well, we already have communicated a few things that he taught, but in the single greatest, longest pericope in scripture, the passage that has the greatest length to it on forgiveness by Jesus himself is found in Matthew's gospel. If you have your Bibles, I wanna encourage you to turn, click, tap, if you're using electronic a Bible, to Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. 
Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Now, the apostle Peter comes to Jesus and he asks him a question. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. So this is the apostle Peter. The other disciples, apostles are around and he's asking this question. How many times do I have to give forgiveness? How many times do I extend this forgiveness? And he asked him up to seven times. Now in rabbinic Judaism, there would have been taught that you give forgive three times. So I think that Peter thinks he's being generous here. He's extending even further the expectation to this number seven. And he thinks, okay, this is really great. And Jesus responds to him and says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. So the New Testament is primarily in Koine Greek, but there is parts of it that are in Aramaic, all right? Old Testament is ancient Hebrew, then you have Koine Greek, but then you have this uh, uh, section where there's Aramaic. But here in the Greek, the way that this is constructed, biblical scholars over the centuries, New Testament scholar, scholars, they do not know whether or not Jesus is saying to them uh, 77 times or 70 times seven. So if you had a translation that could say that Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, you don't forgive seven times, but 77 times, or I'd tell you not seven times, but 490 times. Now, is Jesus being literal, depending on how a biblical scholar may choose to interpret that or a pastor may choose to preach it? No, he's not being literal. He's not saying, well, if your husband or wife is doing something that irritates you, you must forgive them 77 times, but on the 78th time, whack, go ahead and let them have it. That is not what Jesus is saying, right? On the 491st time, you just light them up. No, that's not, you throw your shade, right? No, 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 no. What he is saying here is simply this. He is saying that you forgive without ceasing. You forgive relentlessly, Forgiveness has no limits. But I think he's teaching something even different and maybe far more consequential than that. I think he is saying you start forgiving when you stop counting. And not until then. You still counting? You still find yourself counting? You start forgiving when you stop counting. And Peter said, well, Lord, I just, but Peter, you have to understand it's important that so long as if you are still counting, you haven't started forgiving. Jesus taught this, and we know that that's exactly how the heavenly father and the Lord Jesus Christ has extended forgiveness to us by the, his shed blood on the cross. Second Corinthians chapter five, verses 17 and 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The brand new is here. What the, We are new people. We have new hearts, a new life in Christ. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. So the only way that we get reconciled to the heavenly father is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has given to us then a ministry of reconciliation. He gave us this ministry. He says, now I hand you a message and a ministry according to 2 Corinthians chapter Five, but what is the key here? That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ specifically by not counting people's sins against them. So I just, you don't owe me. But Lord, I've sinned against you so much, yeah, but you don't owe me. So the first thing we have to understand is that God began his forgiving when he stopped his counting and it's the only way it's gonna happen for you and for me. But because Peter and the apostles are standing there, and I think that there's some perplexed looks like, oh my goodness, that's a lot of forgiving. Jesus says, Peter, let me tell you a story. And he breaks out into this parable, verse 23. Let me tell you a story so you understand how serious I am about this, that you'll start forgiving when you stop counting. He says, therefore, Peter, to the other apostles, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. 
As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, literally in the Koine Greek, it's 10,000 talents. A talent was the highest denomination of, of money, of currency, okay, as a medium of exchange. So there were 6,000 denarii and one talent. A denarii was one coin and that coin was a day's wage for a laborer. So in other words, let's say right now, minimum wage is, let's just say it was about, it's about 15 bucks. I know literally it's not, but let's say it's $15 an hour. And at $15 an hour uh, times eight hours in a day, it's $120. In our culture today, one coin, one denarii would be one day laborer's wages. A talent had six thousand denarii. So 6,000 days is 16 point something like six or so years. Okay. So you're 16 years in one denarii. Now notice what Jesus tells in this story. There's a king who wants to settle accounts. When he began the settlement, he found someone who owed him 10,000 talents. You know how much that is for a day labor? 164,383 years. I want to say that again. You would have to work 164,383 years at an average day laborer's work to pay that off. In other words, if you extrapolate this out even over time today, the wealthiest people in the world don't have enough. Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, they don't have enough money to pay this back, period. But this is part of the point Jesus is making. So verse 25, since he was unable to pay, not even able, not even capable, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all he had be sold to repay the debt. Back then, if you, they had debtor's prison. If you couldn't make your car payment, your house payment, your Vista, American Express, MasterCard, they throw you into debtor's prison, all right? Now, I realize that they didn't have credit cards back then. I'm speaking anachronistically, okay? Verse 26, at this, the servant did what? He fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. Could you please just be patient with me? I'll pay it all back. The servant's master, the king, took pity on the servant, canceled the debt and let him go. Canceled that debt and then let him go. What did he say? You don't owe me but I owe you, not any longer. There is no I owe you. You do not owe me. Verse 28, but when that servant who had been forgiven of the 10,000 talents or 164,383 years of debt, when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins or literally in the Koine Greek, a hundred denarii. You know what that is? That's a hundred coins for a hundred days of labor, which means it's about three Months and 10 days, 100 days worth of work. It could be worked off in a little over three months. That's possible to pay that back, right? I mean, easily you could pay that back, but notice this. It says, when he found the one who owed him that 100 denarii, he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant then fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused Instead, he went off and had that man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. And they went and told their master everything that happened. Hey, you remember that guy that got on his knees, he was crying and begging and you forgave him of 10,000 talents? We saw that same guy that you, he was so grateful and jumping up and down when you forgave him. He ran out into town square and choked the guy out for a hundred bucks, right? For a hundred days worth of, of work, a hundred denarii. Says then in the scripture, and this is, <clears throat> this is disturbing, but yet very, very powerful passage of what Jesus means as he's telling Peter and the apostles this. It says, when they told the master everything, then that master called the servant in, verse 32, you wicked servant. Now, I don't know about you, Eastview, but anytime 
Jesus is telling a parable and calling someone a wicked servant, I want to know, is there any chance, by any chance at all, could I happen to be that wicked servant? You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. So Jesus finishes telling the story. Peter asks a question about how many times to forgive. Jesus says, forgive relentlessly without ceasing. Don't ever stop forgiving. And then he says, let me tell you a story. He tells the story. And then when he finishes the parable, he has one thing to teach. And that's it. One statement, one verse. Jesus says, Peter, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you. Say it out loud with me, would you, Eastview? What? Unless, unless you forgive your brother or sister from where? Your heart. From your heart. Jesus seems very serious about this. Now, I'll just speak for me. When I read this, I see that he is teaching me very clearly you start forgiving when you stop counting, but what else is Jesus taught? Don't be an unforgiving, forgiven person. It's, it's, it's simple, right? It's, but remember, pride will cause us to miss the simple. Pride will cause us to not see what is obvious. Don't be an unforgiving, forgiven person. To forgive as the Lord forgave, again, we must pay attention to what Jesus taught and what Jesus did. Well, now this is what Jesus taught. We see that. But now let's pay attention to this. What did Jesus actually do, right? What Jesus taught and then what Jesus did. So what Jesus did matters deeply. Luke chapter 23, verse 34, this is what Jesus did. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. On the cross, when they are bludgeoning him, when they had pummeled him, when they had stuck a spear up his side, a crown of thorns on his head, beat him with that cat of nine tails, hit him with their fist, spit on him, mocked him, put the purple robe on him. In fact, 700 years before the crucifixion and the bludgeoning of Christ, the prophet Isaiah prophesied, 700 years before it happened, he said he would be beat beyond recognition. You wouldn't even recognize him. They had dis disfigured his face and scarred his flesh. And Jesus there on the cross looks down at his murderers, the perpetrators, and he, he extends forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they are doing. He extends forgiveness to those who don't deserve it. I know it's easy to say, Tommy, you don't understand the person, what they did to me. They don't deserve it. They owe me. They owe me. But aren't we then choking them out even though we've been forgiven of much? In Jesus' story, it's pretty simple. He's the king and he truly is the king of all kings. And how much has our heavenly father, our one triune God as father, son, and Holy Spirit, how much has he forgiven us, deeply forgiven us, and then called us out, 2 Corinthians 5, to have a ministry of reconciliation to not hold grudges against others. And the call of it is always, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. The Christ-like sanctification is, I extend forgiveness to those I think don't deserve it. But after all, neither did I and neither do I. I'm always grateful and thankful for my anchoring times. A lot of people call them quiet times. I call them anchoring times out of the book of Hebrews because I wanna be tethered and anchored to what matters most as the oceans of the cultural whims through cultural accommodation and cultural adaptation move. I don't wanna be adapted to it. I wanna be adapted to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I want my accommodation to be in Holy Scripture. To do this, I better embrace deeply what I read just in the previous weeks as I'm going through praying Psalms and praying through Luke and my personal anchoring times. Psalm 103, 
He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Man, that's beautiful. Or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. So far as the east from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. I mean, so then I should not treat others as their sins deserve. Which means the extending of forgiveness is gonna look a whole lot like how Christ Example and emulation on the cross is how I'm supposed to extend forgiveness to others. But you say, but Tommy, you don't know what they did to me and it cost me so much and it's so painful. Forgiveness is always costly. Forgiveness was costly to Christ. Forgiveness is costly to the heavenly father. Forgiveness, there's always a cost. Yeah, but when you forgive it, the cost goes away. The cost never disappears. Think about what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he who knew no sin became our sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Jesus never even sinned, but he took on and bore the payment and the penalty of our sins on the cross, even though he himself never sinned. Where's the justice in that? There's not. Only love and the grace and mercy. And once again, us getting something that we don't deserve. So what does Jesus do in extending forgiveness? The wage of that sin must still be paid. He still drinks up the cup. John chapter 18, verse 11, Jesus commanded Peter on the night when he was arrested and Peter pulls out a sword to defend his friend and his savior. Jesus says, put away your sword, Peter. Shall I not drink the cup? Shall I not drink the cup? that the Father has given me. What do you mean? Drink the cup of suffering. Shall I not, as one famous pastor has said, absorb the cost? What does this mean? This means even in forgiveness, that that, that's, that's why it's hard. That's why it's so hard. You absorb the cost by saying, you no longer owe me. I no longer choke you out. You don't owe me. You don't owe me an apology. You don't owe me the money back. They stole my reputation. They don't owe you. This is where forgiveness begins. Well, this is so hard, but this is Christ-like, Holy Spirit-empowered forgiveness is that we do absorb the cost. We do drink. There's always, even if, so when my daughter, Rebecca, years ago, and she was a junior in high school, she wrecked, or maybe it was her senior year, she wrecked her car, okay? And the insurance covered up to only a certain amount, should have had State Farm, and, uh, and, and so, and, and so, so the, there's, you know, this, this, this chunk there that it's called a deductible. And that deductible was several thousand dollars. And so I was like, well, honey, she was all in tears and crying, daddy, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to. I said, honey, don't, babe, don't worry about it. It's all good. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. She's like, but daddy, it's so expensive. Don't worry about it. You are forgiven. Now, let me say something. I can forgive her. You say, oh, well, it's all forgiven then. There's no cost. No, the, the, the value of the car has decreased. You say, well, just don't fix it. Now there's no cost. Correct, but the value of the car has still depreciated even more because it's been wrecked. So what is love and grace and mercy is that I drink up that cost as her father right? Well, now, for full disclosure in the story, I made her pay $1,000 out of babysitting money and different things because I'm not quite like Jesus. I wanted her some skin in the game, right? (laughs) But the spirit of it is, it didn't cost her what it would have cost her. But no matter what happens, you say, yeah, but that's the whole point. I don't want to suffer anymore. They've caused me enough hurt. That just gives them more power. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, you are living under the power of the bitterness and the resentment of the enemy, and he has his fangs in you, and he is winning so long as he can cause you and rise up in you hatred for them, anger, resentment, bitterness. There's where, then they have the power, not them even, 
This is not a battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spiritual that, that the enemy then is winning by causing. The truth of the matter is love and forgiveness means somebody drinks up the cost, just like Jesus did on the cross. And he knew no sin and didn't deserve it. So Jesus absorbed my debt into who he is by his shed blood so that I could no longer be held accountable for that debt. And then what? Then I get his righteousness. So the one who never sinned takes on our sins and the one who has never been righteous, there is none that is righteous. No, not one. All of our throats are open graves. Romans chapter three. There's a stench that comes from me. I'll speak for me. I'm a wicked man. Who's gonna save me from this body of death? I feel like the apostle Paul. Thanks be to God and Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans seven. So what happens? Somebody drinks up the cost and forgiveness. So to say you no longer owe me means Philippians chapter three has to come alive in your heart. It means to anybody who's watching from wherever you may be watching around the world or another camps or whatever, it means that Philippians chapter three, you identify not only with the fellowship of his resurrection, but you identify with the fellowship of his suffering. You know how you identify? You always say, how do I identify with the fellowship of suffering? I didn't get up on the cross. Well, the Bible calls us to identify with the fellowship of his suffering and his resurrection. We love the victory over sin and death and the resurrection, but to identify with the fellowship of the suffering is, means sometimes we suffer when we don't deserve it. And that's what forgiveness looks like. Somebody's got to drink it up and absorb it. Now, we can't bring redemption to them like Jesus can. That's not possible. But what we do is we still do exactly as Christ has called us to do. So to forgive as the Lord forgave, pay attention to what Jesus taught and what Jesus did. I was born in Scottsdale, Arizona, suburb of Phoenix, Arizona in 1967. My biological mother walked out on me when I was an infant. My parents would divorce shortly after. I'd go and live with my grandparents in Phoenix for the first two years of my life. My dad had started a brand new company. It started to become very successful. He moved the headquarters from Phoenix, Arizona to Dallas, Texas. So for the first two years of my life, I lived with my grandparents. My dad went away. I think my mom went up to Alaska to be with her parents and sister. My dad, living in Dallas, met another lady, married her. He's on a second marriage. She had two boys, then they would have another son together. And when I hit about two years old, he sent for me, and I moved from Phoenix to Dallas to live with them. That marriage lasted until I was in seventh grade. And then one day, uh, my mom and dad, more literally my biological father and my adopted mother, who legally adopted me on the at the county courthouse steps in Dallas, Texas. When I was probably like eight years old, she adopted me. Her name was Patty. My biological mother who walked out on me, her name was Beverly. Patty legally adopts me and my father and my mom uh, say, boys sit around and the four of us boys gather around the table and uh, they say, hey, we're getting a divorce, but you can choose who you wanna live with. Well, of course, I felt like it'd be a total insult not to go with my biological father, so I went with my dad. Fast forward a few years later, I'm 15 years old. It's the summer between my freshman and sophomore years in high school. And uh, my dad and I had a bad falling out, really bad. And I ran out of the house. For years, I blamed my father uh, and said it was all him. As I've matured and grown in Christ, and I still am maturing because there is no arrival in Christianity, um, I realized that uh, it wasn't just my dad. And I learned to take ownership too for my part you know, all of us like say, oh, it's them, it's them, it's them. Say, well, what percent is your part? So oh, maybe 2%. Okay, then why don't you own 100% of your 2%? Well, I got 5 or 10%. Well, why don't you own 100% of your 5 or 10%? I realized it was, that it was way more higher than that. You know, right? that, that, that is my father and I, the tension that we had, and, uh, but we didn't speak to each other for a long time. I went and left his house and went back to live with my mother, Patty. 
But she had already fallen in love with another man, a rancher from a suburb of Dallas, uh, McKinney, actually, McKinney, Texas, actually a little town called Princeton, and he was in the cattle business. And so she moved out there with him, and she said, you want to move up here and go to McKinney High School? I said, no, I want to stay at J.J. Pierce High School here in the Dallas area. I do not want to move again. She said, well, your father paid off this house. He was very successful and wealthy, paid off this house in the divorce settlement. The market's bad. It was the 1980s. She said, you can live here until the market returns and you graduate from high school. So my sophomore, junior, and senior years in high school, I lived by myself in this five-bedroom home in the North Dallas area. I was not a believer. I was not a Christian. My dad's full-blooded Greek. I grew up going to the Greek Orthodox Church when we would go basically at Christmas and Easter or whenever ever Father Katinas affectionately known as Father Nick, would come by the house and when the priest would stop by, I'd tell my brothers, hey, we're going to church Sunday. Well, why? Because Father Nick, Father Katinas came by and I know that guilt is a great motivator. And so we, we would go to church, but we were very unchurched. Sometimes we would even miss Christmas and Easter. We, we were very sporadic, but I did not know Christ as Lord and Savior. I had never repented of my sins. I had never received the gift of grace and forgiveness and mercy and Christ shed blood on the cross. I was not a believer. During that time living by myself, my junior year, I'm 17 years old. I meet a classmate, a fellow classmate. He's 16 years old. We're both in 11th grade at Pierce High School. And we were playing a basketball game one Tuesday night. His name's Doug Miller. And after the basketball game on a Tuesday night, uh, we went to a restaurant, a pizza restaurant, and over pepperoni pizza and Coke, we began to talk. He was the first person I ever told. I'd already been living by myself for about a year and a half. And I finally told someone. I didn't know what the laws were. I, didn't know. I, kept, I kept it to myself. I never threw parties at the house. I, I just was like, I don't want to blow this. My mom had told me, you cause me any trouble, you're out. Patty had. So that night in that pizza restaurant on Coit Road, it's called Pizza Inn over pepperoni, pizza, and Coke. I opened my heart to Doug. He said, man, that must be really lonely. I said, oh, it's very lonely. And then he took that opportunity to turn the corner. The next thing I know, we're talking about Jesus Christ and his faith in the Lord and how it brings him peace and comfort. And I was blown away. I'd never met anyone like him. Out of 770 something people in our graduating class, he ended up being our class salutatorian. He was ranked second. He was also a tremendous athlete. He was our star baseball player and, uh, at, at the high school. And he was humble, but there was something about him that was just so different. I could see it, I could feel it. Well, after we were done eating pizza, we got in his 1984 Maroon Ford Mustang, drove to the front of our house, all right? So this, I'm letting you know, this is the winter of 1985. I'm 17, he's 16, we're both in 11th grade. We parked the car in front of the house and the last words I remember before I got out to go into that empty house by myself is, is Doug Miller saying to me, hey, you know that thing that we talked about tonight, would you like to give your life to Christ? I said, Doug, I'd really like to, but I, I'm just not good enough. He's like, you're missing the point. And he started trying to explain to me. I just remember him talking about things like grace and mercy and nobody's ever good enough. But it just, for whatever reason, I just wasn't, I wasn't ready. I got out of the car that night, went into that house and uh, went into my bed to go to sleep, but I couldn't sleep. It was like a over and over and over, the words that Doug had shared just kept going through my mind and wouldn't stop, like a broken, broken record player, you know? For those of you that are too young to know what that is, ask somebody after the service. They'll, <laughs> they'll tell you what a record player is. But the next morning, Wednesday, in the winter of 1985, I go to first period, second period, third period get to my third period Spanish class, second floor of J.J. Pierce High School, right on the dividing line between Dallas, Texas, and Richardson, Texas. I'm about two-thirds of the way back where the C and D students sit, and uh, I'm back there at the back of the, and, and Mrs. Rush is up at the blackboard conjugating Spanish verbs, hablo, habla, sublemo, sabla. I wasn't paying a bit of attention. I bowed my head down on that desk, and I prayed, and not like this. I crossed my arms over like this, and someone's probably like, look, Polits, he's fallen asleep. But I hadn't, I was so overwhelmed, so I prayed and I said, I prayed two things. I prayed first, 
oh Lord, please don't let Mrs. Rush call on me right now to come up to the blackboard to conjugate Spanish verbs, right? I'd be like, sorry, Mrs. Rush. I mean, you know, Tomas, can you come up to the blackboard to conjugate Spanish verbs? I said, no, ma'am, I'm too busy praying to receive Jesus into me corazón. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like, so I prayed that she wouldn't call on me, but the second thing, I prayed to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior right there in that Spanish class. I said, Lord God, if you forgive me, if you could forgive me, please, Lord, what Doug said is true. I need you to come into my heart and life. I need you to change me and make me a new person. It was a supernatural transformation. Supernatural. I'm not an expert in much of anything, but I'm an expert in my own testimony, and I know what happened that day. That third period bell rang, and the next period was fourth period split lunches. I took off. I ran down the hallway. I ran up to Doug Miller's locker. I said, hey, Doug, his locker was like six or seven lockers down from mine. I said, hey, Doug, Doug, you know that thing we talked about last night? Yeah, I think I just did that. Did, did what? Gave my life to Christ. Doug said, when? I said, in Spanish. <laughs> He said, you gave your life to Christ in Spanish? I said, no, dude, I gave my life to Christ in English. <laughs> if I'd prayed in Spanish, uh, my Spanish wasn't very good. Lord, make me a noon perro. I might have asked him to make me a dog or something, right? I looked at Doug. I said, no, I prayed that prayer. He said, what did you pray? I told him what I prayed. He looked at me. He goes, close enough. I said, close enough. This isn't horseshoes and, hang horseshoes and hanger nades. I need to know, did I or didn't I give my life to Christ? Doug said, did you ask him for forgiveness of sin? Yes. Did you invite him into your heart? Yes. Are you sincere about it? Yes. Welcome to the family of God. Heaven is yours. Forgiveness and cleansing is yours for all eternity. It wasn't a 72-year-old wise pastor that mentored me. It wasn't a godly mother who was on her knees in prayer for me. It wasn't a student pastor who had just finished seminary. It wasn't some older man of significant understanding and wisdom that walked me through the scriptures. It was a 16-year-old, 11th grade, baseball-loving, God-fearing, Jesus-pursuing young man that gave me my first Bible when I was 18 years old for my 18th birthday in our high school parking lot that discipled me. All we talked about till we finished high school, till I'd go off to Baylor University, he'd go off to Texas A&M. <laughs> we talked about three things, the Lord, sports, and girls. <laughs> and not in that order. <laughs> we weren't that spiritual. He would die of a brain tumor at 29 years old. I'd have to speak at his funeral Giving a eulogy is one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Pull back just a little bit. I'm 27 years old. I get a phone call. It's Beverly, my biological mother. We've never talked, never seen each other. She says, I'd like to meet you. I said, what is there to meet? You walked out on me. She said, just there's some things that need to be said. There's nothing to be said. You can say it on the phone. No, oh, Tommy, would you please let me say it to you face to face? Okay, fine. Where are you? I live in Denver, Colorado. I'll fly into Dallas if you'll meet me. September of 1994, I'm 27 years old. I'll never forget it. Me and my wife, Donna, had been married two years. We drive to the airport that morning. This is back when you could actually meet your loved ones at the gate. It was pre-9-11. We're walking down the concourse of, of the airport towards the, the gate, the jetway. Don and I are holding hands, and my beautiful wife, so sweet. And uh, she'll still say to the stage, she, she said, said, do you remember what you said that day as we were walking towards that, that gate? You were like, two things I'm not doing. She goes, you were so prideful. Two things I'm not doing. Number one, I am not calling her mom after all these years. That would be cheesy. I'm calling her Beverly. And then you said, and I am not going to hug her because that would be just awkward and weird. But then another thing happened while we were on the way. I was like, I don't even know what she looks like. She doesn't know what I look like. And I don't have a cardboard son that says, this is your son whom you abandoned. I don't have anything <laughs> like that. So, so we're, 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 we're heading down and she's like, I don't know. I don't know. 
And I'm telling you, when we got to, we were running a little late and they had already gotten off the plane and there was a crowd there at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And it was like a bad Hollywood movie because it felt like the crowd parted and a beam of light shone down on this woman that I was staring at. And I knew that was my mother because I was looking at a full-on Tommy Shemel. I was like, yep. <laughs> my father always said that I looked like her. He said, you have her cheekbones, her skin color. You have her eyes. I started walking toward her as we recognized each other. You know that moment when you're so nervous you can feel your heart beat down in your fingertips? And, and, and my hands are sweaty and I, I made, made my way to her and then we're face to face and I'm looking into her eyes and she's looking into my eyes and I'm like, wow, she's as beautiful as my dad always said she was. After we finished hugging, and my wife gave me that look, bless your heart. <laughs> we headed back to the house, finished up our pleasantries. My wife had made uh, some like cookies and brownies, tea, lemonade at our one bedroom, 700 square foot efficiency apartment in Irving, Texas. And she says to this day, neither one of you touched a single refreshment. When we were done with the pleasantries, we sat down in the living room. I was in a chair, my wife was to my right, and my mom, Beverly, was here to the left. After we got done with all the small talk, I just simply said, what happened? Where have you been? She just starts going into everything that happened. And I said to her, I said, you missed everything. And her hands are shaking. Her voice is quivering. Her eyes are getting watery as she's explaining her life and what happened. 27 years. And I'm thinking, you missed the first day I got on bus for kindergarten. You miss my baptism. You miss my wedding. You miss my college graduation. When I was living by myself in high school and I got food poisoning from eating a hamburger, I was so sick and too dumb to even know I had coughing up blood from the constant vomiting. I could have died. You were never, ever there. And as I'm thinking, I wasn't saying all this. I was just thinking this as she's explaining. I feel the Lord say, Tommy, say it. I'm like, say what? Lord, say what you need to say. No, she needs to say it. She owes me. She did this. I was just an infant. She was an adult. Say it, Tommy. And it wasn't like this audible voice like, say it. You know, it wasn't like that. But you know those Holy Spirit moments that if you do not obey the Lord Holy Spirit, you may miss out on one of the greatest life change epic opportunities that you'll ever have. And I knew I needed to say it. So I reached out my hand in the middle of her explanation. I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, you know what, Beverly, it really just doesn't matter. I forgive you. And she started bawling the water. She's weeping. She's crying. My wife uh, to the right, she's crying. And I'm still negotiating with God. And uh, I just want to just tell you what happened to me that day. Since I was a little boy, I resented her. I was so upset. How could you walk out on your own kid? But the only thing I never realized until that day was the, my whole life I had kept her locked up in debtor's prison, just like the parable. Had her in this little closet with the door shut. That's where you get to stay in my heart. You get no peace of me to the bottom of who I am, no. And I opened up that door on that day to let her out only to realize that I came walking out that it was me that had been set free from the poison of the enemy, that all my life I had missed the obvious that was right in front of me. The simple that Jesus teaches. I don't know you and I don't know your story. I just know what Jesus taught and what Jesus did. And I believe that I've come all this way from Texas to deliver a message for someone somewhere that you are wrecking your life by not following the compassionate, merciful teaching of our Lord and our Savior. Now, in the 1970s, Beverly had become a Christian by reading a book. She started praying for me in the 1970s. I didn't become a Christian until 1985 in that Spanish class. 
the earliest known person I know that was praying for my salvation was my biological mother. And to this day now, we are so reconciled. I call her mom. I send her text messages with hearts and kissy faces and all those things. And I love her dearly. And we are reconciled. I know that I can never get back and she can't get back what the enemy took from us. But in the kingdom of heaven, all wrongs will be made right in the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to that, I give glory and honor and praise to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But what did he teach and what did he do? Don't listen to the world. Listen to him. Heavenly Father, I pray your hand on this church. I thank you for their patience for an extra long sermon today. I pray that there is much fruit that bears deep into the heart and soul of the people of Eastview for just the one person who needs to be released, for the one person who needs to be radically changed by your grace and mercy. Lord, remind us you have forgiven us of so much. How could we then choke out somebody else? If there's anyone here who's not given their life to you, Jesus, in order to forgive like this, may they first be forgiven by you. May they say to you right now, where they're seated or where they're watching, may they say to you genuinely, just between you and them, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart and change me. Make me a new person. I want to live for you. I believe you died for me, rose again for me. I receive you into my life as my Lord and my Savior, my leader, my forgiver. Now teach me to forgive others as you have called me to. For it's in Christ's holy and strong and forgiving name we pray these things. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but my heart is just uh, bubbling up inside, being convicted by the Holy Spirit. And there's really just a simple question for us um, as we leave. Who is your pride keeping you from forgiving? You might have noticed that we didn't actually take communion in this service together, but I'm sure you all grabbed it when you came in. We did that intentionally because of a, a verse that Tommy actually spoke about. That when you're on your way to the altar, if you realize that there is a grievance between you and someone else, that you leave your gift, you go and be reconciled, and then come back and offer your heart to the Lord. So that's our action step today. Who is the Lord asking you to forgive? Family member? friend, yourself. With that mindset, take your communion home with you. Whatever the Lord is asking you to do, do it. And then with a pure heart, come to him and take communion on your own this week. I'm going to pray for us and then you guys will be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for this powerful word that we have heard this morning. As Tommy prayed, would it bear fruit? Would we Please, God, would we be forgiven, forgiving people. Help that be true in our church. We love you so much, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed.